everyone on behalf of the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute at Harvard University, which is also a Harvard Global Research Support Center in India. I welcome you all to today's session. The title is up there, Evictions, Demolitions and Relocations in the Run-Up to Mega Events, Impacts on the Lives and Livelihoods of Urban Poor. I'm Dr. Monica Setia, India Associate Country Director at the Institute. Um, starting off with a brief background of the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute at Harvard, in short, also called the Mittal Institute or LMSAI. We engage in integrative research, advancing and deepening understanding about critical issues being faced in South Asia. We have twin offices, uh, one in Boston, Cambridge at Harvard University and another in New Delhi, which is based in the heart of Delhi in Connaught Place. Mittal Institute was founded in 2003 to further Harvard University's engagement with South Asia. The Institute works with Harvard faculty and students and in region institutions to disseminate knowledge, build capacity, inform policy through scholarly exchanges and fellowships, sponsor lectures and conferences at Harvard and also in the region. And today's session is an example of that in region event. We also bring knowledge from South Asia to Harvard through research grants and build a community of stakeholders and which includes all of you who are joining us today, either in person or virtually. Harvard University formally recognized the South Asia in Initiative as an academic institute in 2013. Our work spans across South Asia, including Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India, Maldives, Myanmar, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Bhutan. We're very thankful to Professor Marty Chen, our Harvard faculty, and also a board member of Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, we go in short, for putting together this panel on a very important and relevant topic. Marty, as many of you may already know, is a scholar and a social worker with specialization in areas of employment, gender, poverty, and informal economy. She received her PhD from University of Pennsylvania, has been affiliated with Harvard since 1987, and has worked for decades in Bangladesh and India, with large part of her work with BRAC and Oxfam. She's also chair of BRAC Global Board and chair of UNU Wider Board. She has authored multiple books and research articles in her areas of specialization. For her eminent work in Bangladesh and India, she was recognized for the respective governments, receiving Padma Shri in 2011 and Friends of Bangladesh Liberation Award in 2012. Thank you very much, Marty, for agreeing to moderate this panel, a conversation that began just almost two months ago during my visit to Cambridge when I actually first met Marty. Thank you, Marty, again. I will let Marty introduce the panelists and take things forward from here. But before I hand over to Marty and let the session begin, I want to thank all our panelists for taking out time to speak to us and our audience. A big thanks to a small team in Delhi, especially Namita Verma, our program coordinator, who's right behind you, and Mr. Amit Chaudhary, our administrative coordinator, who I'm very sure is busy outside taking care of something, for putting together multiple pieces of the session. And we really appreciate all our ad audience members for joining us today and giving us an opportunity to engage with them. Rains have been lashing hard. There was a big yellow alert today. We were really not <laughs> to join us. So really thank you who braved up to and showed up in person despite the heavy high alert that today was given by the Indian Med Department, which kind of also explains the low attendance. You know, we were expecting more people, but absolutely great that all of you could join us. Um, so enjoy the session. Keep, un keep in touch with us now and later. And over to you, Marty, for introducing the panelists and taking things forward. Thanks so much, uh, Monica. And thanks to the Mittal Institute for um, proposing this webinar and hosting and organizing it. It's such a pleasure um, to be here. And I want to join you in thanking the panelists, um, especially um, Shalini Ben <coughs> Sinha and Bijal Ben. Rambat for helping design and organize the webinar and the audience um, as well. I want to thank you. Um, I should say that um, I serve on the board of the Mittal Institute and it's been a pleasure to watch the Mittal Institute grow and evolve and especially its Delhi office um, coordinating many events such as this. Um, the topic for today's panel is very timely, very important. Uh, this is because the urban poor are frequently evicted from their homes and their workplaces 
and relocated <laughs> to wherever the government sees fit in the lead up to mega events. In the process, they are literally and figuratively swept off the map to borrow the title from a title of a book on this topic by the well-known urbanist Gautam Ban. And so to illustrate how evictions, cum relocations impact the lives and livelihoods of the urban poor, this webinar will focus on one such eviction and relocation um, in the lead up to the 10, 2010 Commonwealth Games. Um, it will explore how residents of informal settlements in central Delhi were relocated to a quite inhospitable overgrown area between two villages Savda and Gevra, from which the settlement gains its name, about 30 miles outside Delhi, near the border with Haryana. We have a stellar panel. Arvind Uni is a housing and urban rights activist. He's an architect by training who has over a decade of grassroots experience working on the housing and livelihood needs of the urban poor. Savita Ben, she's listed as a resident of Santa Gerva, but we will hear what it took to become a resident of that area. She's also an entrepreneur and a community leader. After a fairly traumatic forced relocation to the Savda Gerva area from Paharganj, Central Delhi in 2008, Savita Ben managed to rebuild her home, to find work wherever it was available, and eventually to start her own business. She sells uh, sewing supplies to other women who stitch garments in their homes. Through her involvement with the Myla Housing Trust, Savita Ben also became a community leader. And I have had the great pleasure of being on a, at least two other panels with Savita Ben and last October visiting her in Santa Gerva and seeing her very neat and well stocked uh, shop of sewing supplies. Bijo Brambat is the director of the Myla Housing Trust, uh, which aims to improve the quality of habitats and build resilience to uh, climate change in informal settlements by empowering local women such as Savita Ben and promoting participatory governance. A civil engineer by training, Bijal Ben has been a pioneer in upgrading informal settlements across India. And she has received several national and international awards for her work. And most recently, at least to my knowledge, MHT's work, Myla Housing Trucks work on heat proofing low income housing was cited by the BBC. Shalini Sinha, Shalini Ben, is the Urban Asia Lead and Home-Based Work Sector Specialist for the WeGo Network. And I should add that the WeGo Network seeks to empower the working poor in the urban informal workforce to secure their livelihoods by demanding inclusive cities. And Shalini has worked with WeGo for quite some years and has focused on developing and documenting decent work and livelihood opportunities for women workers in the informal economy. And home as a place of work is an area of special interest to her. Shalini was active in the Mabhidhili campaign for a people-friendly master plan for Delhi. And before joining WeGo, she worked for a decade or more as a development consultant. So in this panel today, Arvind will provide an overview of evictions, demolitions, and relocations in India 
with a focus on Delhi. And the other panelists, Savita Ben, uh, Shalini Ben and Bijal Ben will focus on the process of resettlement in Sabda Gerva, how those who were relocated had to resettle themselves, rebuild their homes and livelihoods with more help from non-governmental organizations such as Myla Housing Trust and WeGo than from government. And during the panel on the chat function, Shalini Ben will post documents detailing the Sabda Gerba resettlement, um, including a timeline of the overall resettlement and a storyline of Savita Ben and her family's resettlement. So over to you, Arben Bai. Each panelist will speak for 10 minutes and I'll track the time and uh, try to signal to you. I'll say time's up when it's two minutes to go. And, um, and then we hope to open it up for a lively discussion. So over to you, Arpin Bai. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mati. Uh, pleasure to be here uh, and to be talking on such a, a critical and a important issue. Um, I will, since we just have 10 minutes, I'll, I'll try and kind of bracket the discussion on uh, firstly, what are evictions? How do they happen? And what is the kind of uh, modus operandi of, of evictions in uh, Indian cities in general and Delhi uh, particularly uh, with respect to housing and, and livelihoods? That's section number one, if uh, that, that, that is how I begin. Second is also a, a sort of a look and uh, an experience of what is happening in the last six months, especially in Delhi and across uh, other cities in the country. Third would be a sort of an attempt to, again, talk about uh, maybe the Lee campaign and the effort that we took as, as a campaign to think a little proactively and, and think of, of a sort of a long-term approach to, to uh, deal with evictions, demolitions, and, and relocations. Um, that would be the structure of the of the sort of uh, pointers or discussion that we have right now, and then of course we hope to kind of uh, have open discussion on it. So, uh, firstly, I'm like a disclaimer to begin with is that I am uh, speaking from practice and a practice of around twelve years of uh, working with communities, people in Bombay, Delhi, and elsewhere. Second, uh, being that uh, whatever I speak is from uh, experience of of, of uh, uh, people and their struggles and, and their resistance in, in that sense. So all uh, sort of understanding is stemming from there. Third, that I might sound a little grim uh, because circumstances are such, uh, but it's okay for me to be grim because I'm not the one that's, that's kind of resisting or struggling on the ground, but, but there are hopes, there are opportunities, and that is what kind of uh, brings us here. So. That's a little disclaimer that I want to put up in the beginning. So um, to begin with, what are evictions, demolitions, relocations? Sometimes all of these all combine together. Evictions are a very sort of a mundane, uh, ordinary uh, act in Indian cities. They are uh, usually carried out by different state apparatus, agencies, so on and so forth, but, but you have agencies uh, that are called uh, enforcement departments. They are not the EDs uh, that, that we have right now, but these are actually uh, enforcement departments and, and their job is to just enforce bylaws, regulations, master plans, so on and so forth. Uh, these departments are also very sort of coveted and looked after, sought after, because they are the ones who are actually engaging on the ground and dealing with informality uh, in the city and trying to sort of uh, put informality into a mold of formality or, or the state uh, made state led plans and regulations. And unfortunately, our cities are mostly not that starting from livelihoods, starting from uh, uh, the spaces that uh, we work in, the spaces that we stay in are all informal of different degrees and shades. That's, that's a different sort of a debate altogether. But essentially, the state through these different arms and sort of departments try to regulate, uh, enforce 
a sort of uh, regulation that the state sees that informality should be in. Uh, to just give you an example that uh, even after the Street Vendors Act that came in 2014, which is called the Protection and Regulation of Street Vendors Act, a huge chunk of TVCs, a huge chunk of street vendors are still managed by enforcement departments. So I, I was just having a discussion a week ago in Pune Municipal Corporation and the department was called enforcement uh, and they were the ones looking after uh, the implementation of the Street Vendors Act. And I told them, why do you have this name? This should not be there. You should think of changing that. And they actually said that we'll look into it. So that's point number one. Point number two, is that whilst it's a very routine affair, uh, almost like a spectacle and anyone who has been to, I don't know, maybe Bombay more so and, and, and uh, other markets in Delhi, let's say like a Palika or not a Palika, Janpad, CP, so on and so forth. So enforcement, regulation and informality on the ground, it's like a sort of a ballet dance in, in some sense. And, uh, and, and it's just a spectacle to kind of keep things on the boil, so to say, and, and to kind of extract more from either livelihoods, housing, so on and so forth. Till the point that you have bigger or a more sort of graver violations in the form of reservations that are, uh, that have to be put to use, or you have uh, uh, land demarcations of right of way, roads, highways. When such questions come up, these spectacles or sort of animated sort of performances stop happening and you have the state enforcing its sort of full agency and power and and uh, uh, kind of exercising the the brute force that that we see but essentially evictions demolitions are a sort of a root, routine day to day affair which are sometimes very tight tightened sometimes they are loose but mostly it's a sort of a negotiated settlement that happens between the state the different actors that constitute informality. And there are a lot of middlemen, uh, so on and so forth. There are different mechanisms in which informality is controlled. Uh, but there are, third point, there are waves that break this sort of uh, uh, status quo in terms of uh, informality and its regulation. The waves, especially uh, what you see in uh, cities like Delhi, have, have been there in the past in the 1960s, 1970s in the emergency period, uh, where slums or any sort of informality was seen to be as something that has to be cleared, has to be removed, uh, uh, and has to be taken out of the city and, and put across. Uh, but then you saw uh, a trend in 1980s where such resistance, a lot of resistance from civil society and a very proactive civil society, uh, as well as judiciary, kind of play, bringing a lot of litigations, uh, kind of paved way for future, especially let's say in the case of street vendors, housing rights, so on and so forth, came about in the 90s. Uh, and, and if you then yourself to Delhi, what you see is that, that you have uh, uh, a sense of, um, that you're not really happy with, with what's happening, but at least there are spaces where you are getting uh, uh, land in the peripheries, uh, even though they might be very far off, even though they might be very sort of, uh, the lack, lack of services would be pretty apparent there, but still there was some sort of a wiggle room within the judiciary and, 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 the, and the establishment. And they were willing to look at offering land, alternate sites uh, to, to the parties or, or to, the, to the informality that's displaced in the city. That is a kind of approach. A benevolent welfare state was still visible in, in 80s and 90s. Things changed in 90s where land uh, was seen as a commodity, had to be monetized, and it gradually reflected in our policies, master plans, regulations, urban planning documents. And that changed the way uh, Delhi's master plan, for instance, uh, was talking about land as as something that has to be reserved for for housing, for for street vendors, for informal workers. But that all changed in the 1990s and with the last uh, development plan that we had of 2001. Uh, but this also meant that there were a lot of struggles, uh, fight that led to led to some sort of uh, uh, before that actually Commonwealth Games was such one 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 wave that happened 2010. 
uh, which led to a lot of evictions and and there was a lot of um, what do you say communities and their uh, their resistance and and people's fight on the ground that led to Dusib Act and its formulation that led to Sudama Singh's judgment that kind of protected uh, summary eviction so to say. Uh, Dusib in 2015-2019 gradually so Dusib is the Delhi state government body to look after slums, their displacement, their improvements, so on and so forth. So from 2010 onwards, you could see that there are these better off policies that are not really that bad, but at least they had some sort of a wiggle room for civil society, for communities to kind of ensure to, to get some bargain uh, in, the, in, the, in the whole process of evictions and demolitions. And which meant that, and you also had a power change in Delhi, you meant, so then you had uh, a sort of a status quo again with the Delhi government being more sort of sensitive or at least on paper with these rules and regulations, at least on paper being more sensitive and the central government not knowing what to do with with uh, these uh, uh, informants. Arvind, Arvind, your time is coming to a close. So okay. please hurry along. So Okay, I'll, I'll try and uh, speed this really up. And uh, similarly, we had the Street Vendors Act that came about in the same time. Uh, a lot of progressive uh, regulations and schemes that came about uh, for homelessness. All this has, for instance, changed, I think, in the last six months. And uh, we know why uh, this has happened. And this could be easily called the fourth wave of evictions, demolitions, and, and possibly relocations that are happening. And uh, there are four or five reasons that I would wish to kind of share with you of why this is different and why. I would say that the city, uh, especially the informal city, is under siege, and there is a sort of a war that is being waged in in our cities. And as we speak, at least the count that I had is that uh, we have, in the last four or five months, experienced around sixteen to seventeen big demolitions in Delhi alone. And if you scale it up across the country, you have around uh, fifty cities going through the same experience from from our engagement. Uh, why this is different? Uh, point number one is the scale and the nature of the evictions. Point number two of how coordinated and planned out these evictions are, and if, as if there is a there is a sort of a dog whistle slash toolkit that's been circulated, uh, because when Mumbai does cover up of slums, you also have Indore and Bhopal doing the same. You have. Uh, you have painted the hell out of the city, uh, wherever, whatever wall that you find, you have done that. So paint, plan, cover, demolish. This is the toolkit, uh, so to say, that is being sort of circulated. And this is happening simultaneously across in around 50 cities. So brings to a question that we uh, uh, have really coordinated this kind of level of action. Point number three, uh, of how this is different from what has happened in the past is that there are no notices, there are no eviction sort of prior informal uh, information that is passed on to communities. There are no alternatives. For the first time, I think in the last 20 years, we are seeing that there are no alternatives offered. Alternatives are offered post the, the evictions and sometimes the alternatives are as, as uh, absurd as that there are these three homeless shelters uh, that that could be used in case there are slums that are demolished. And by the way, Delhi has seen that homeless shelters, which were the models for uh, a lot of what's happening in uh, in the country, those were also uh, demolished and and taken off. Uh, the courts, which were uh, uh, not empathetic, so to say, have played a very proactive role in bringing uh, uh, to the front and clearing a lot of case backlogs that had to do with these demolitions and have played a very well coordinated role in, in allowing these uh, cases, uh, these uh, demolitions to happen. That is our observation uh, because otherwise to see that all these removals have happened in the last uh, six months. Marty, I'll just take two minutes and then uh, come to a close. Uh, Point number six was the amount of money that is being allocated uh, at the central level and at the at the city level for these actions. So our guesstimate and on record is that thousand crores at the center and every other these 50 to 100 small cities are putting in 100 crores to 50 crores each 
to do these cover-ups and plantations, paintings, so on and so forth. Demolitions, evictions, that human resource cost is not being considered. And all this is happening in, in, in our sort of country where one rain can kind of send in <laughs> alerts that you have off today and you're not supposed to go to work. So those are the things that tell us that uh, the sort of expected norm of evictions also has been kind of broken. And once our experience suggests that once these things are broken, they kind of are imposed in practice and would be kind of scaled up going forward. How this differs, last three points from my side, that uh, for instance, uh, Smart cities, I feel, I feel, and many other feel played a key role in 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 kind of being dry runs for these evictions, because evictions otherwise to be coordinated at this level and scale, uh, if it were not for missions like smart cities, Swachh Bharat missions, where where sort of a centralized sort of uh, instructions uh, could be circulated and and were circulated in the implementation of these schemes and projects, were and should be recognized as dry runs for these bigger scale evictions, point number one. Point number two, that complete collapse of vote bank politics. We knew that post-2000s, post-2010s, vote bank, or I mean, the sort of electoral majority that the urban poor had has considerably come down, but they don't matter at this stage because even to do that when you have just one year for elections and to expect that you will still get the votes in uh, suggests that of that convent uh, would have uh, uh, with uh, or to counter such tactics as evictions, which points the party or parties like Congress, which is not in power and would, uh, wanting to have these votes have not acted in, let's say, other cities. I'm uh, just trying to explain that. Last, I think the the use of imagery of world classness, smart cities. Uh, and the use of imagery of, let's say, something like uh, a bulldozer model of development, which uh, suggests uh, 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 the sort of inexplicable use of bulldozers to evict street vendors, which has not happened in the history of street vendors uh, uh, and, and their struggle and movement, is, is one uh, uh, aspect that suggests that, that there is something very, very different and very, very uh, sort of sinister about what is happening. And this uh, were to be, if it were to be scaled up, would, would translate into uh, informal settlements, ghettos, lower middle class uh, to, to be forcibly removed without alternatives, uh, without any space in the city and without any space even in the periphery. So these were the initial thoughts that that we as civil society and as, as uh, activists uh, working on evictions have. Uh, we can come to of what are the different means of uh, possibly countering this, but at least to kind of recognize that this is happening and this is happening across 100 odd cities as we speak uh, in, our, in our country right now. So those would be my uh, introductory sort of comments, Marty. Thank you very much, Arvind Bai, for that very realistic uh, history on this, the phases of regulation and the waves of evictions and the very um, distressing assessment of the current wave. Um, very important backdrop. Um, Savita Ben, I want to listen to you and your history, so tell us. Yeah, thank you so much. नमस्ते और मैं शारदा देवीका जयपुर कॉलोनी में रहती हूँ 2006 में हम शारदा के ग्राम में आए थे पहले हम पहाड़गंज में रहते थे तो वहाँ पर हमारे अच्छे से मतलब सही ठीक ठाक रहना था वहाँ पर बच्चे काम भी सही था और मार्केट वगैरह भी ठीक ठीक ही थे पास में सदर बाजार था पहाड़गंज थाने के सामने हम रहते थे तो सब कुछ बहुत अच्छे से था बच्ची मेरी स्कूल जा रही थी बड़ी वाली बेटी नौ साल की थी तो स्कूल जा रही थी पांच में ही पढ़ती थी सरकारी स्कूल में फिर उसके बाद ठीक चल रहा था फिर उसके बाद 
एक हमारे पास नोटिस आया कि आपको ये बिजली हटा के और आपको वहां जाना है तो जगह का नाम बता दिया फिर वहां पर जब हम पहुंचे तो एक मिनट में ट्रांसलेट कर लेती हूँ मैं अंग्रेजी में बोलती हूँ जो आपने हिंदी में बोला क्योंकि हमारे बहुत सारे गेस्ट ऐसे हैं जो ऑनलाइन भी जुड़े हैं उनके लिए एक मिनट रुकिएगा तो सविता बहन स्टार्टेड टेलिंग अबाउट हर जर्नी फ्रॉम सविता बहन जब अगली बार बोलना तो माइक के पास हाँ तो शी स्टार्टेड हर जर्नी शी स्टार्टेड टॉकिंग टू शेयरिंग हर जर्नी विद अस इन 2009 2009 में ना 2006 सॉरी 2006 is the time when she was she had to move to sabda gebra before that they were living in pahar ganj and everything was very well her daughter was going to school eldest daughter she was 9 years old and things were very good there was sadar bazar close to pahar ganj so it is pahar ganj for those who don't know delhi it's quite a central um, very very in fact i would say it's the heart of the city uh, where savita ben was saying and then she is now going to tell us um uh, the, what happened when they were told to move to uh, this new place called sabra gebra which she had not heard about um in 2006 to jab aap udhar aapko bola gaya wahan jaane ke liye to fir uske baad kaise jab bola gaya to wahan pahunche to wahan par kuch bhi nahi tha एकदम बिल्कुल दूर तक जंगल था पता नहीं कितने किलोमीटर तक वहां पर जंगल ही जंगल दिखता था पेड़ पौधे और उसके अलावा वहाँ पेड़ पौधे के अलावा कुछ नहीं थी खाली बंजर जमीन तो वहां पर जैसे ही वो बुक है तो ऐसे करके वहां पर बॉक्स बने हुए थे जमीन पर ऐसे करके 12 मीटर 18 मीटर ऐसे करके बॉक्स बने हुए थे उसके अलावा कुछ नहीं था तो वहाँ बॉक्स पे जैसे नेम प्लेट लगी हुई थी और ड्रेस प्लेट ये है ये आ, के मतलब के के पांच सौ त्रेपन है ये चौवन है पच ऐसे करके जिस जिस का नाम का प्लॉट था इस तरीके से तो वहां जाके तो बिल्कुल हालत हमारी खराब हो गई वहां पे हमने देखा वहां कुछ भी नहीं था तो हम तो ऐसे हो गए कि पता नहीं दुनिया ही जड़ गई थी एक तरह से तो कोई स्कूल थे मतलब बंद थे बने भी नहीं थे अच्छे से और कोई सुविधा नहीं थी कुछ भी नहीं था ना कोई मार्केट ना कोई कुछ नहीं था वहां पर फिर हमने सोचा कैसे रहे काफी लोग थे फिर वहां पर हमने बंदे होते बांस वो गाड़े चारों तरफ ऐसे करके गाड़ के और फिर त्रिपाल से उसको ऐसे बनाया ऊपर से ढका तो डर लग रहा था कि जानवर भी थे वहां पर तो बहुत डर लगता था छोटे छोटे बच्चे हैं भगवान सांप वाप निकलते थे कीड़े जमीन में और बहुत डर लगता था कि कोई हमारे बच्चे को काट लेगा तो कैसे क्या होगा और हमारे पास कुछ साधन भी नहीं था रहने का और कहाँ चले जाएं तो फिर वहां पर हमने किसी तरह रहे कि पहले तो वहाँ खाट वाट पर बैठ के दो तीन दिन गुजारे दो तीन रात ऐसे करके गुजारे फिर नांगलोई है पास में वहां से फिर हम सामान लेकर आए फिर हमने एक झुग्गी जैसा कच्चा सा ऐसे ही बना लिया बारिश बारिश ना हो बच्चे जानवर आनवर ना आए तो वहां पर हमने अपना बना लिया फिर हम उसमें रहने लगे फिर रहते रहते फिर हमने उसको वहां पर पास ही में किसान लोग हैं खेती है उनकी कोई काम नहीं था पहाड़गंज में तो मेरे हसबेंड इलेक्ट्रीशियन का काम करते थे कूलर पंखा पंखे मोटर वाइंडिंग बिजली की फिटिंग वगैरह ये सब करते थे क्योंकि वहां पर था काम और वहां पर तो कुछ था ही नहीं तो किसकी वाइंडिंग और किसकी फिटिंग तो वहां पर हम बिल्कुल ऐसे हो गए बेरोजगार कोई सुविधा नहीं तो फिर उसके बाद वहां पर फिर हमने वो पास ही में खेत थे तो उन्होंने देखा किसान लोगों ने कि यहाँ पे कुछ लोग आए हुए रहने तो उन्होंने कहा कि आप कैसे आए हो कैसे फिर हमने उनको बताया तो उन्होंने कहा कि आप तो यहाँ पर हमारे पास ये जो खेत है आप इतना काम कर सकते हो यहाँ मजदूरी कर सकते हो आपको काम मिलेगा और वहां पे कोई ना रिक्शा ना कोई बस कुछ नहीं था कच्चे रास्ते थे जाने का भी कोई सुविधा नहीं था तीन किलोमीटर हम जाएंगे घेवरा मोड़ तो वहां से हमें रिक्शा मिलना था तो साइकिल वगैरह भी नहीं थी हमारे पास तो फिर वहां पर हम काम करने लगे उनके पास और हमें पानी भी लेने जाना था तो घेवरा तीन किलोमीटर घेवरा मोड़ वहीं से घेवरा गाँव उसमें जाट लोग रहते किसान लोग घेवरा गाँव सावदा गाँव सावदा कॉलोनी के साथ ही थोड़ी दूर दो तीन किलोमीटर सावदा गांव है वो भी जमींदार लोगों के गांव है तो वहां से हम पानी कभी कोई देता कोई नहीं देता 
तो ऐसे हमने वहां पर तो काम भी किया तो वो अस्सी रुपए देते थे एक दिन के गाजर का काम था वहां पर खेती का सीजन का काम होता था सर्दियों में गाजर का काम गर्मी में प्याज का काम टमाटर का काम ऐसे करके तो वहां पर हमने जब किया तो अस्सी रुपए मिलते थे एक जने के तो मेरे पास बच्चे उस टाइम बहुत छोटे थे मेरे पास एक बेटा है छोटा और उससे पहले मेरे पास बेटियां हैं चार तो छोटी वाली बेटी मेरी छह महीने की थी लगभग तो मेरे हस्बैंड लाते थे अस्सी रुपए में कुछ नहीं होता था फिर घेवरा मोड पे काम पे से आते थे सात आठ नौ बजे फिर घेवरा जाते थे फिर आटा ये वो लेकर आते किसी का कोई साधन भी नहीं था ऐसे पैदल जाते थे उसके बाद फिर हमने मैंने भी जाना शुरू किया आके देखा तो अस्सी रुपए में कुछ हो ही नहीं रहा है सात लोग हैं अस्सी रुपए में कुछ नहीं हो रहा है फिर ये बोले कि तुम भी चलो तो मेरी छह महीने की बेटी थी मैं उसको लेके जाती थी बेटी छह महीने की थी तो बेटा ढाई साल का था दो छोटे छोटे बच्चे थे उनको लेकर मैं साथ जाती थी तो मैंने भी काम किया फिर आते थे एक सौ फिर हम करते थे उसमें फिर धीरे धीरे फिर दो में महिला हाउसिंग ट्रस्ट संस्था आई तो फिर वहां पर हमने जैसे वो मीटिंग्स वगैरह करते थे गलियों में घूम के तो वहां पर वो मीटिंग करते थे तो वहां पर जैसे कि यहाँ तक मैं बता दू जी तो सविता बहन है in savda ghevda there was nothing there there was just forest and the land was marked into boxes and each of it had a name and a number and you had to find there was absolutely nothing it was undulated terrain there were forests and animals all around us there was no construction nothing and she went there with her young children very very young children daughter was as young as 6 months old son was 2 and a half years old and other children and uh, they didn't even have shelter they were scared that the animals would come insects would come snakes would come and bite their children so for two three days they almost sat on a cot and lived there also cooked from the cot and then they went to a village uh, say savda village close by and got bamboo poles put up bamboo poles and tarpaulin and had a cover like that um, but and then after a few months then built a, uh, a hut so that they would have shelter and protection from the weather and animals in terms of work she said that her husband was an electrician where they were earlier in pahar ganj so there was a lot of work available repair work etc but there was nothing over here so there was absolutely no work and uh, in the neighboring uh, areas there were these farms so they husband decided to work in the farm the wages were as wage laborer the wages were 80 rupees mm, per day and um, it was not enough to sustain their entire family but also the fact that there was no transport so he would come back late from work and then have to go and buy provisions and other things etc so it was proving to be very difficult so they decided that she would also go to work and savita ben went with her young children the 6 month old daughter and two and a half years old son to the field uh to work and then they managed between both their salaries they managed for a few years <clears throat> uh in 2006 mht came to this area mahila housing seva trust and um, the uh, the organizers started walking around in the uh, roads in the lanes and to- uh, that's where we are so aap bata rahe the ki mht 2006 mein aayi 2008 में 2008 में सॉरी में फिर संस्था वहां पर आई तो फिर जैसे उन्होंने जागरूक किया कि मीटिंग वगैरह करते थे तो वहां पर फिर धीरे धीरे जैसे कच्ची सड़कें कच्ची एक थी वहां पर जैसे गली में खरंजे वगैरह डाल ले कुछ टाइम बाद फिर नाली वगैरह भी नहीं थी वहां पर नाली उखाड़ उखाड़ के लोगों ने इधर उधर अपना मकान में कुछ कर लिया तो वहां पर फिर कच्चे मकान बनने लगे वो चादर डाल के किसी ने किसी के पास बजट था उसने बना लिया जिसके पास बजट नहीं था उन्होंने नहीं बनाया फिर वहां पर जब उन्होंने मीटिंग में बताया कि हम लोन वगैरह देते हैं हाउस लोन आप लोन ले करके आप अपना बना सकते हो 
तो जिसकी जैसी इनकम थी वहां पर किसी ने चालीस हजार का लोन लिया किसी ने एक लाख का लिया मैंने लिया चालीस हजार का पहले इसके अलवेस्टर डाल के मैंने क्योंकि इनकम इतनी ज्यादा नहीं थी फैमिली बड़ी थी तो खर्चा भी देखना था तो उसी तरीके से फिर हमने लिया उस पे चादर डाल के हमने अपना किसी तरह पक्का थोड़ा बनाया जानवर भी आते थे बहुत उनका डर था और कोई शौचालय वगैरह कोई कुछ भी नहीं था दूर मतलब कि अपने जहाँ रहते हैं उसी से थोड़ी दूर आके जाके बहने शौचालय जाती थी तो बहुत सारी बहनों की रेप वगैरह भी हो गए वहां पर और क्या कहते हैं फिर बहुत ज्यादा वहां पर कोई नहीं थी सुविधा बहुत ज्यादा अच्छा उसके साथ साथ फिर हमें ट्रेनिंग भी मिलती गई के जैसे पानी नहीं आता था पानी की कोई सुविधा नहीं थी फिर टैंकर आने लगा एक ब्लॉक का एक टैंकर आता था तो बहुत मारपीट होती थी बहुत झगड़े होते थे तो बहुत झगड़े होते थे तो एक प्रेग्नेंट बहन भी थी बेचारी तो पानी भरने गई तो वहां पर एकदम मैं पहले भरू मैं पहले भरू तो पूरा टाइम था उसका तो वो बेचारी गिर गई और उसके मतलब बच्चा भी वहीं पे खत्म हो गया वो उसी में गिर के भीड़ में और उसकी हालत खराब हो गई जैसे ही हम हॉस्पिटल उनको ले जाने लगे हॉस्पिटल वगैरह कुछ नहीं था उस टाइम कोई डिस्पेंसरी कोई कुछ नहीं था तो जब हम उनको ले जाने लगे वहां तो एक हमारे यहाँ पर गेटरा पे फाटक है तो वहां पर उस लेडीज ने दम तोड़ दिया तो उसके बाद फिर हमने फिर बहुत सारी वहां पे दिक्कतें उठाई फिर उसके बाद में हमें पता चला कि वहां पर जब ट्रेनिंग हुई तो हमें बताया गया कि ऐसे मारपीट होते तो आप टैंकर बढ़वाओ जब हम ट्रेनिंग में जाने लगे मीटिंग में जाने लगी तो वहां बताया गया कि आप टैंकर बढ़वाओ तो हमें तो पता नहीं था कैसे टैंकर कहाँ से बढ़वाएं फिर उन्होंने हमें बताया कि आप जल बोर्ड ऑफिस जाओ एक एप्लीकेशन लिखो और उसमें सब बहनों के साइन कराओ अपने ब्लॉक के और और बाकी ब्लॉक की भी बहनें आती थी और ट्रेनिंग में तो इसी तरह फिर हमने किया तो हम दस बीस बहने जा, जा करके वहां पर और हमने साइन अप्लीकेशन एक लिखी और हमने वहां की वीडियो जो वैसे था बताया वहां पर कि दिक्कत हो रही है तो फिर वहां पे हमारे टैंकर भी बढ़े पानी के तो इसी तरह हमारा पानी भी बढ़ा फिर वहां की जो नालियां वगैरह गंदी रहती थी वो हमें ट्रेनिंग मिलती रहती थी कि एम भी जाओगे आप तो वहां से आपकी नालियां भी साफ होंगी तो इसी तरह हमें महिला हाउसिंग ट्रस्ट ने बहुत आगे बढ़ाया फिर कुछ समय बाद हमारे वहां पर सी वो बनाए हमारे महिला मंडल मतलब सीएजी ग्रुप बनाए हमारे तो वहां पर हमें ट्रेनिंग दी गई हर चीज की तो आज हमारे मंडल बने हुए हैं सारे ब्लॉकों के और जैसे कि के ब्लॉक का मंडल है हमारा शक्ति महिला मंडल और मैं उसकी अध्यक्ष हूँ अपने मंडल की तो हम परसों ही गए थे एम जी के पास तो हमारे यहाँ पर जो भी कोई दिक्कत होती है एमसीडी की दिक्कत होती है तो हम एमसीडी जाते हैं जल बोर्ड की दिक्कत होती है तो हम जल बोर्ड जाते हैं और जो हमारे जैसे रोड टूटे हुए हैं या और कोई तो हम एम जी के पास जाते हैं तो हमें काफी मतलब कि काफी आगे बढ़ाया एम एस टी ने और काफी हमें जानकारी दी और जो मैं आज इतना यहाँ पे बैठ के बोल रही हूँ इतने लोगों के बीच वो भी हमें एम ने ही बोलना सिखाया वरना हम बोलना नहीं जानते थे अगर किसी से कोई झगड़ा हो गया पुलिस आ गई तो हम डर के अंदर चले जाते थे तो बिल्कुल हमें बोलना नहीं आता था लेकिन काफी हमें सिखाया एम एस से हमें बहुत कुछ सीखने को मिला और हमें फिर वहां से शौचालय की सुविधा मिली जो बहुत ज्यादा दिक्कत थी जिस चीज की फिर हमें वहां पर शौचालय की सुविधा मिली उन्होंने हमें शौचालय का सामान दिया वहां पे शौचालय बनवाए हमारे लिए तो उससे हमें बहुत फर्क पड़ा क्योंकि बहनें फिर बाहर नहीं जाती थी अपने ही घर में रहते थे तो उससे भी हमें बहुत ज्यादा बहुत सुविधा मिली उससे और फिर हमारे घर के लिए भी लोन मिला तो बहुत बहनों ने घर अपने लोन लेकर के बनाए सो सविता बहन सेट दैट 
uh, in 2008, when MHT came, they started making us aware about so many of these things. And for instance, they started pointing out the absence of drains, streets that were not built, and uh, and offered loans to upgrade homes. And many, many, many of my sisters who had money, depending on how much money they had, they took loans. And many people built brick walls with asbestos cover. So she also took a loan of 40,000 and built walls, uh, built a house uh, of brick. But it was a little, it was not a formal housing because it was just walls and with a cover. The other problem was that there was no toilet and it was particularly a harsh reality for women because all kinds of uh, incidents in, would happen and there were often cases of rape and insecurity women felt uh, was very strong. The other thing was also there was no water. So the water, there was no water connection. So the water used to come uh, in tanks. Uh, water tanks and every block uh, would get one tank and obviously there was a lot of uh, people uh, fighting to get to access to water and one very distressing incident she was uh, saying about a, uh, a woman in full term pregnant woman in full term uh, actually um, uh, injured herself lost the child and when they were trying to take her there, there was a take her to the hospital or a dispensary, none of which was close by. It was further off. There was a, a railway gate, which closes to let the trains pass. And there is one till today, I know, in Saabda Avenue. So that at that railway gate, it was closed and she died. So that was very traumatic uh, for them. But... Um, MHT then started talking to them about how to address some of these issues. For instance, for tankers, they said that you could you can ask for tankers and go to gel board and ask for tankers. So they would write applications and uh, get all the women from the community to sign and go and demand more tankers. Similarly, for cleaning the drain, so the MCD, they could approach. So, so these way outs were pointed out and they were trained by MCD to fend for themselves by accessing the service providers, government service providers themselves. In the process, um, Mahila Mandal or community action groups was were developed by MHT. Uh, these are all women community action groups and um, Savita Ben is the chair of the community action group, group in her a block K block, and uh, she said that two days back we had only we had gone to MLA. We know for what to go where, for water to go to Jalnigam, for MLA for road, etc. So we had gone to them, and finally she was winding up by saying that um, uh, it, to be able to speak here or with the other government officials was also taught to them by MHT. We used to feel scared when the police would come. We would hide and go inside the house, but to be able to uh, speak uh, in front of the uh, officers, who to speak to, all that was taught to us uh, by MHT. Uh, MHT also provided loans for building toilets, both provisions uh, and uh, loans, and also to uh, continue to provide loans for upgrading homes. Sabita Ben, we can listen to you, तो मैं बस आपको बोलने चाहती हूं कि आपकी शक्ति और आपका जानकारी इससे हमको बहुत इंस्पिरेशन मिला थैंक यू खूब मेहरबानी सो बीजल बेन ओवर टू यू <clears throat> Namaskar everyone. So I'm Bijal and I work with uh, Mahila Housing Trust. Uh, and uh, I think our objective is to improve the housing, living and working conditions of poor women in the informal uh, sector. Uh, mainly, you know, building their own capacities uh, to be able to talk to the government, which is the biggest uh, service provider. Uh, across the nation and uh, I think to be able to talk meaningfully because 
otherwise you are absolutely brushed off so uh, to be able to understand uh, the technicalities of schemes of say urban planning procedures of resource allocation and and uh, you know uh, uh, in a meaningful way so uh, what we typically do and what we did in Sauda is we, we did begin our work in Delhi around 2007-8 and one of the first settlements that was referred to us, I think, uh, probably by the government was that of uh, Sauda Gevra. And uh, that's where we actually started uh, working. And uh, I can say that after so many years, there is... Uh, a lot that has happened, but a lot remains to be achieved. Um, so I think, uh, and, and the first realization that I had was when we had gone there was the fact that uh, though they were allocated plots, uh, probably Savita Ben did not speak, but we can ask her, you know, when this whole question of poor's willingness to pay arises, for me, it's never a matter of study because I'll tell you, that they are the people who invest again and again and again. So they will have invested uh, from where they were evicted and where their housing was demolished. They would have already set it up. No one knows. We can ask her how much she had invested earlier. And then they came to Sauda where they got the plot. They only got the plots and not for free. I think it was 7,000 rupees for the plot and later on 10,000 rupees per plot. Um, 12 to 18 square meter and then all of them took these little little loans uh, incrementally one up after the other based on their uh, you know incomes and built their housing over a period of time invested into toilets because we and I do understand that you know, we were not a micro loaning agency of any kind. We uh, were a not for profit. And uh, we actually uh, took one of the biggest microfinancing agencies to Sauda. And we found that, uh, you know, uh, the thinking was very theoretical that, uh, you know, housing is a not reproductive asset. And though that was the need because they have lost the livelihoods, we will first give loans only for livelihoods. Uh, and, um, you know, only then once the livelihoods increase, uh, you know, we will give it for housing. Again, they were not ready to go into such a, such an area which was like 45 kilometers away from Delhi with no metro, no metro, no access. And I remember my colleagues saying it took them two hours from wherever they are to actually reach to Sauda and start the work. So that was the situation and uh, it was all, uh, I remember that they were given uh, what is called a license to stay for seven to 10 years. And that 10 years has obviously expired because the eviction happened in uh, 2005 and 2006. And it, the license has also in that sense expired, but it has neither been renewed nor you know, they are not going to get evicted for any practical purpose, but they are not going to get the legal title also. And the women all say that we are ready to pay for the legal title. So sometimes I really start laughing when there is this willingness for to pay question, which arises because practically I have seen they are the ones who keep investing and reinvesting and reinvesting. And we did do a small study with Vigo as to how much has been invested um, in Sauda Gebra by NGOs, by government, by the people themselves, once uh, they were shifted, I think Shalini Ben will talk more about it. But, you know, the whole argument is that once, you know, the government also had made investments, but the investments were, were more in the nature of having schools or uh, having common toilets or, but they were not in the nature of being given at the household level. although it was a resettlement colony. So community toilets was a big farce because nobody used to use them. There were rapes happening. It was a big issue of dignity, although they were a little bit, you know, pacified because schools were there. So I, so I suddenly realized that resettlements are planned, but the infrastructure or basic services planning does not happen hand in hand with the resettlement. So Still, I, I still remember that the first waterline connection we were able to get 
with a lot of representations from the community action groups that Savita Ben described to the MLA uh, in around 17 and 18, the entire process of laying the main line, because there was no main network till Savda Givra, which was like outside the, uh, you know, uh, city and therefore, because the infrastructure was not planned to, uh, you know, uh, to reach till Savda, although the resettlement was. So that was the plight and the way the way we work actually, I mean, microfinance is something that we would have resorted to last and we were in some sense forced to do it because, uh, you know, people were worried that there is no livelihood, they won't pay back. Secondly, there was in, income was informal and tenure in some sense was also informal and there was no one then willing to do that. But we always, you know, think that it's better to work with the government and build the capacities of this community action group in a big way to represent their own communities, identify needs, run their own organization. So our typical trainings would support them in how to manage their organizations for development, for representing the needs of others, uh, doing small things like how do you drop an agenda? You must meet every month. How what you must write your minutes. What you know? What is it that is coming out of minutes? And then you must have your action plan. And that the other big training is on the governance structure because if you see most cities in India would have multiple service delivery not only through the local government but also through the parastatals like Delhi Jar Bold is a state level parastatal and it's not uh, you know uh, something that the municipal corporation of delhi uh, uh, delhi's function is and also again you don't know where, which municipal corporation your area falls into what zone what ward although ward is the so all these aspects are brought in also the the power of the elected uh, you know representatives and the uh, the the officials i think so a big way is invested into training. And the reason for that also is that we would like to see that if MHT has to withdraw over a period of time, to us, sustainability does not lie only in technology or only in other mechanisms, but the people, you know, take ahead their movement themselves to a certain extent, you know, because um, so uh, that's the approach. And I think, in that sense, we have been uh, very, very successful. So finally, I think in around 18, 19, the water line started. But before that, all each household had invested into taking a loan for putting up submersible pumps. So they were all drawing water from the ground, which is a big, big, where quality is a big issue and at least drinking it. So, you know, in some cases when the water tankers weren't available or weren't enough, everyone had invested into building a toilet. Uh, and still there is no legal title coming forth. So that's the next, uh, you know, sort of ask with the government. Um, I would only like to say that at st this stage that I have been witness to a very big eviction in a city, uh, in the city of Ahmedabad, where we are actually headquartered. Uh, where you know the entire river front and, and developing river fronts is now a big big agenda where the poor actually live and I wouldn't say it was a it was kind of a mixed experience for two reasons one is that when they will they live they go out and live on river fronts because it, it's kind of a no man's land where you know possibility of getting evicted has not been there for a long, long time, which is changing now with the riverfront development in some of the big mega urban development projects. Now, people at the riverfront in Ahmedabad were really happy to get a house, even though they were relocated, because Ahmedabad had somehow worked out that uh, some of these households would be relocated into small sites, into, uh, you know, like three to five kilometers from the riverfront. So when we support, facilitated a little bit the eviction and resettlement process in a way that it would work for the poor. All the poor who were located nearby were very happy, who were located far away were not happy at all. All the poor who, uh, you know, uh, probably uh, could not dream of a legal house like this in the city of Ahmedabad 
and their how you know one of the major reason that they were happy was for the fact that their houses used to get flooded every year during rains and then everything got destroyed so uh, you know this, uh, some of them were very happy and they said we could have never dreamt of having such a house especially home based workers because the housing size that they were given was a little bit bigger than what it used to earlier be however they wanted the uh, but some of them were very unhappy who were flung far away and their social fabric was destroyed and one of the things that came out immensely from the community was that it's not only about what kind of uh, you know relocation uh, happens it's also about the manner in which so they said some of them who were very happy said that uh, you know we could have uh, been asked and uh, you know Uh, the relocation should have been done when uh, uh, the schools were closed because it disrupted the education for our children and the second big thing that came out is because social security schemes are in the invariably linked in india with having aadhar card and social identity cards uh, which are linked with your addresses so uh, they had to change their addresses and for that very long time while they got their addresses changed they couldn't access even the public distribution system or any other for that matter any other social security scheme of the government so they told us and we also learned that the moment they were evacuated they should have camps should have been held in a big way by the government to actually uh, you know ensure that the lapse between the current social security card to the new social security card would have been very very less so i think these are uh, some of our learnings from having worked directly with the communities um, those who are resettled and those who were to be evicted at one point in time and we were called in to uh, facilitate some of those evictions so this has been the learnings thank you so much bijal ben and i know that you combine in a remarkable way being a civil engineer with all the technical capacity but also this deep commi- commitment to community social development as really the the long term uh, solution is to do it with the communities through community leadership and i really uh, appreciate that combination Shalini Ben I'll turn now to you and um <clears throat> to speak about um the work of Wego in this context uh, thank you Martha Ben um I just want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity I also want to thank MHP especially Veena Ben who's here with whom we've been working on this issue for the longest time they have been our partners in and Delhi and um we've been guided by bijal also also i present this this work that i'm going to present today of vigo's work in delhi is a work of a team i'm just presenting it and one of my team members shalaka is here so it is on behalf of all these people that i'm making this presentation um as mati ben mentioned that our work vigo's approach uh, has been around the issue of employment informal employment especially women and we started looking when we started working in delhi under a focal city delhi program we started looking at eviction and resettlement from the lens of employment and i've got these four pictures all four of them are from sabda and they speak evocatively about what uh, bijal ben and sabta ben have talked those on the left show the small sizes of houses because of which living and working spills out in into half on the road to to you know half outside half inside and on the right hand side you can see the clamor for water you can't see the tanker but you can see the clamor for water that again has been talked about so and the little toilet that is literally an extension uh from uh, uh this so this gives you an idea of what we are talking about um next please so uh, as has been mentioned i'm going to skim through this uh, arvin mentioned it but this is a brief history bit dated not uh, uh, we haven't talked about the recent one but basically these reset eviction and resettlement and really the resettlement is the question uh, here because there is no settlement in the resettlement it's almost as if uh, 
it's worse than where you were. And as Bijal pointed out that even where you were, you would have invested in building. And then you go, all that has gone down the drain. And then you go and you start working as Savita Ben was saying, you start building your livelihood again, you start building your life again, you start building your house and infrastructure all over again. And there are costs both in time, both in terms of quality of living and also of course in money. Um, so these were the three phases uh, that we, we were able to sort of identify. Uh, and next please. And in these three phases on the left, you see this um, uh, this plan where you know we we've tried to so the two uh, the two colors yellow and orange are relevant to us and the yellow indicates that in the earlier phases of eviction from the center of the city where they were in terms of distance and you will see they were far closer and then the, uh, in the last evictions they are really at the periphery of the city and as Savita Ven said that it was like in a jungle so it is really in the outskirts. And on the other side, you will see the map of Sabda Ghebra. Uh, not all of it is was realized, but at least it shows you that they were housing and there was common toilet, there was school, but not much social infrastructure um, besides. So when we when we were confronted with this, we, it was important. Uh, um, one thing that became clear to us that the people came first and the house and the infrastructure came after that. But in what sequence did it come and how did that impact on livelihood was another question that we were trying to explore. And then the next please is this timeline that we built uh, of uh, Sabda Gebra. And while we were building this timeline and while we were talking to people or two things came out um, were that it was a livelihood story. People were living in this city for work, nobody came here to live in a slum. And it was when these kind of resettlement happen, it's also a gendered story. What happens to the women? What kind of pressure? What kind of care needs? What kind of livelihood? And you, you can guess some of it from Savta Ben's very evocative uh, telling of a story. But uh, the two, three interesting points over here is that you know if you look at um, the physical infrastructure you will see that you know at the bottom we have Savta Ben standing there photo <laughs> so she came comes first and then you know two three rows up you will see that the water sanitation drain drains come so people are expected to live there with even this very basic facility uh, lacking. And then you will see at the top a little bit about uh, about how the metros are there. But don't don't think that the metros are anywhere close to Savda. Uh, still, the metro uh, is far off and all kinds of informal transport is used to reach the metro, besides which, you know, the metro is not a cheap form of transport in Delhi. Uh, so the costs of that is another question. But even in, in terms of access to mainline transport system came late and still not fully there. And this patak that uh, um, Savita Ben talked about is still there. And it can close for however long. God alone knows it sometimes closes for 15 minutes and sometimes for 60 minutes. So, uh, and for working people, uh, time and travel has a cost, and I'll explain that to you. So, this is uh, just visualizing this uh, Sabda story from the um, looking down at the macro level of the settlement. We also, from the very beginning, were very committed to telling stories of individuals, of people who were living there. And next, please. So, Savita Ben has been a partner in doing that. And her story that she talked about, we put it out in the public domain in many different ways to highlight the kind of challenges families faced, uh, both in terms of their living, in terms of the different kind of work today for lack of paucity of time. She was not able to uh, share with us the different kinds of informal employment that she has had to take up to eke out a little living. And so has her husband. But what we, we were trying to do is very early, as you can see, 2019, uh, we were creating these platforms for uh, settlement um, women to come and talk about themselves, about the kind of problems that they have. So on the left is a poster about an event that we organized in India Habitat Center where we uh, reversed the roles and women came and talked to uh, people who are working on these issues. 
and on the right is uh, something that is again in the public domain and we'll be posting it, which is essentially Savita Ben's story in a more graphic form so that it can be used both by um, people who work on the ground, organizers, as well as people who are studying these kind of uh, this thing. Next, please. Um, the other thing that we did was when we went to Savda, when I first, I remember when I first went to Savda and I got off and started looking around, one of the first things I saw was that there was a truck which would come and women and young girls would start running after it. And I thought it was dispersing some kind of food, but it wasn't. It was giving out work. It was uh, a company, informal company, which was giving out slippers for strap cutting. And women would run after the truck and they would give you a sack of it. And the work was so less and so much needed that women would just sit down there, two, three in groups and start working on it so that they could finish as much as possible, give it back and get paid. So in this instance, what we saw that home-based work, which is typically uh, done by women in settlements where you know, where home-based work is defined as work that is done at home by women. In this instance, we saw that many who were working outside took up home-based work and it became almost like a shock observer for the economic shock that relocation did. And on this map, we have mapped clusters, concentrated clusters of home-based workers. And you will see the blue ones are the resettlement colonies. We've also categorized them from what kind of, all of them are of course informal, but the blue ones are the resettlement colony where we've seen concentrated. Uh, so our experiences from Savda, then we started putting it into a larger study of informality uh, in our cities, informality and gender. Next, please. Um, we again we look at the macro, but we are never, never um, uh, uh, we are guided by what uh, our, the workers and uh, our partners uh, are telling us. And here is again something that we started looking at a home and how the small size of a home has implications for a woman who's working at home. So many times she's converting workplace into living spaces and the the, uh, the cost of that both in terms of her time and her uh, uh, energy is borne entirely by her but also there are other costs there are other risks costs of not having enough place not having being able to store goods buy raw material at a cheaper place not being able to get work water comes into your community at uh, in this weather, everybody is talking about an orange alert. I want to know how many people from the slums that we work in have been able to go to work today because they are all completely flooded. So, and uh, the government and other, uh, as Arvind was pointing out, um, uh, have said it work from home. Do do the constituency do that we represent have this opportunity of working from home? So it's really ironic that uh, it is there. So the macro view from the settlement point of view, employment, fraud, home-based work, and then a micro view from one home and where we studied every two hours how the space was being used for economic activities and for other activities for the women. Next, please. Uh, the other thing that emerged with which we got was the whole issue of transport. You know, as I said, that there was no transport lines and it was so difficult to transport. So here is this sto story of a domestic worker who didn't used to work as a domestic worker before. Um, um, uh, she's Rena Ben and she never used to work. She was a housewife. But you will see the figure above her is the income, household income. Uh, before eviction and then after eviction. So before eviction, it is only her husband earning and there is uh, a big white pillar you can see. And then subsequent, because he doesn't have enough work, she has to add her uh, blue uh, pillar to the household income. But then what is the kind of cost that has to be? So first of all, we always try to do cost in terms of money. And that is important. And uh, in this instance, it is, it is, I think, what we calculated was 20 rupees um, um, per day, which is, uh, you know, about 600 rupees, which is for an income of 10,000 or something, no less. This is only one person. If both of them were going out to work, we don't know. But also the cost of insecurity of being able to, uh, this thing, the infrequency of buses. Women often told us that if you miss the 6.30 Subhaka bus, then 
you don't get anything till 11 o'clock, which means that you don't get that day's work at all. So the insecurity, the risks of um, losing work was so, so high because of this kind of transport. And this story then made it very clear to us. She works for a much shorter period of time, but look at her. She starts uh, from home at eight o'clock, gets at seven. So her travel time is almost as high uh, as her work time is, as a productive, economically productive time is. And therefore, it is, I think, a very important issue to also. Also, uh, while we were doing this study, uh, COVID happened. And in this social distancing, the informal transporters who were providing, who were transporting them from Savda to wherever the bus stop is or wherever the metro station is, that completely collapsed because it is on shared travel. And with social distancing, it completely collapsed. So at one level, you don't have work. At another level, you don't have uh, transport facilities to go for work. Next, please. So, uh, and simultaneously with all these in investigations, we started supporting uh, with MHT, um, the people from Savda. As Bijal was pointing out that when they came to Savda, they were given a pink parchi, I think it was called, na? gulabi parchi. And that was a tenure for a payment of 7,000 to 10,000. And that was a tenure for 10 years. Before this, whenever the uh, resettlement has happened in the earlier versions of resettlement, people were given pieces of land, but a tenureship of 99 years. So it made sense for people to invest in building a house and invest in. Now in Savda, what happens is that th there is this tenureship for seven to 10 years. And most of it, by the time we, we, we had started working there was over. So the tenure insecurity is very high. Now, this is also the place we are living where you are, many are working. And why would you not want to invest in this kind of a place? Your families are there. So people are continuing to invest without knowing whether it is a worthwhile investment. Would you like to build a house and uh, know that two years down is going to be broken down? And if we can't do it, how? but it ha it's happening. And the investment is not just from the uh, community members who are living there. And those are large investments from poor people to build a house, to build a toilet, to build a chat, uh, some storage space, uh, a tanky, a submersible pump. These are big investments where your livelihoods are in doldrums. But also the government is also investing, you know, lines, water lines, etc. So our then argument started saying was that if everybody is investing here, why not regularize it? What is this insecurity of tenureship? And we did several studies with MHT to document some of these investments that was being made by the state, by the community, and by individuals. In the meantime, there was this 2013 policy that came, Lucip promoted it, Arvind referred to it, and we studied it and took it back to the community and uh, for their feedback. And based on that, we have these various recommendations. I'm not going to go into details, but basically this, um, recommend uh, this policy was for a selected number of settlements and our uh, advocacy has been in, um, till today, uh, along with MHT, is that it should be applicable to all resettlement colonies and the new one should get freehold. So, and this has happened in many other places, it can be done. Secondly, uh, this whole thing of not recognizing homes as places of work and zoning regulations which uh, deregularize uh, work spaces. Uh, that should be done away with. So, you know, micro enterprise, a home-based worker is less than a micro, micro enterprise. She's a very small, uh, uh, this thing, and her livelihood income is very critical to her well-being and that of her family. And therefore, and then the two other recommendations are that in terms of payment and in terms of documentation, one should factor the reality of poor people. 10 years back, you got a pink slip. And then with that, many other documentation, if it is not available, can we think of alternatives which are easily available and easily able to, uh, poor are e easily able to get? So some amount of understanding of what is available and not a very sort of watertight ivory tower built policy. And secondly, um, uh, in terms of costs, um, if A, it should be fixed and affordable and B, it should be, th there should be some space 
for it to be paid incrementally. Because when we study how people are building houses, are investing in housing, it is always incremental. It is not at one time you go and start building. So similar kind of reflection in a policy which allows you to pay uh, incrementally. And finally, which is a problem with all policies, that they are written in English and complex languages, which even we find it difficult. And uh, so, uh, you know, either you um, um, partner with an NGO like MHT to facilitate access and understanding, or uh, it should be done in a way and uh, shared in a way so that uh, people who are the beneficiary, who are supposed to be the beneficiary of such a policy would benefit from it. Uh, next, please. So, uh, this yeah, Shalini, we need to wind up. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we have a little time for yeah. Q and A. Minutes. So basically, some of this experience that we again moved it scaled up to come to the city, <clears throat> and uh, we were part of this uh, campaign. All three of us, uh, MHT and Arvind and myself and Savita Ben also. And here is this photo of a meeting where Savita Ben is uh, attending, and uh, Veena Ben is this thing about. Uh, how to take the master plan. Delhi was writing its master plan at this time when we were doing this, how to take the master plan to the people and how to get the people's input into the master plan. And this is what we did. Next, please. Uh, so the while the master plan, next, please. While the master plan talked about uh, uh, eviction and relocation, one of the new things that we wanted to talk in the master plan was social infrastructure. So you heard stories about you know not having social infrastructure, not having... Uh, um, quality care, child care, quality hospitals, et cetera. But the whole issue is of space. If there is no space allocated, how can you do it? And therefore, one of the recommendations that we as part of maybe the Lee campaign made was what was called a multi-purpose community center, where the uh, existing space for community center would offer a bouquet of services. And these various services that I've listed here is the bouquet of services. And next, please. And that they would also have some times of something about scale and use. So what is being offered at the community level, maybe what is needed by women in terms of storage of raw material or some kind of training or access to scheme, but what is being offered at the ward level could be slightly different bouquet. So what is highlighted at the community and what is highlighted at the ward level would be different. So the bouquet of services is there, but their emphasis um, differs at different scales. Uh, and that is completely determined by the users with which we are trying to say. So this was uh, something new that we talked about multiple uh, uh, multiple center for uh, this thing. And I think uh, that's all I have to say. I want to end next, please. I want to end with this image from Savda of the, the first, uh, 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 my visit where they are, can you see she's using that harsh thing, her hands and thumbs and are very hard. And she's using cutting those uh, chappal straps uh, with this thing. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Shalini. And thank you all of the panelists for um, providing such important insights into this complex everyday reality of evictions and relocations, both the um, the sort of distressing level and uh, nature of the current evictions, but also the resilience of Savita Ben and countless others in rebuilding their own lives and the remarkable work of um, the Mahila Housing Trust and the support role of WeGo, um, which gives us some hope and some sense of direction. So we have a little bit of time, very little for Q and A. Should we start with what's in the chat? Or are there people I can't see, so I can't, <laughs> I can't direct. People who have questions. Maybe we could start here, Martiben, and then take the chats. Okay, yes. If you, I don't see the audience, so if you could, get yeah. people call people up yeah if it's okay with you we'll take both the questions and in the meantime we'll pull together the chat questions if that's okay with you yes please please go ahead
Well, uh, Marty Brand has to give me the time for me to have walked here and I'll go back. And it's a bit of a strickler for rules, Marty is. Uh, <laughs> Peter Balin and uh, and I work in publishing industry. And thank you so much for having invited us over here. Wonderful, very realistic presentation of actually what's happening at uh, Sauda Gevra. And many of these were eye openers to some of us. Because not much has appeared in the mainstream news. Quickly, I'd like to take your mind back to another event that happened in Delhi. Now I realize quite some years ago, more than 40 years ago. <coughs> and that was the staging of the Asian Games here. At that time, I did one of the first studies of the migrant labor, especially concentrating on women and children who had been brought into the city to build all the facilities for the Asian Games. As we know, in any kind of a labor sector, especially in formal sector, and more particularly migrant sector, women and children are the most vulnerable. I will not go into the details of the study, because Martha will ring that uh, bell of hers. <laughs> but what I would like to uh, say is that uh, uh, there was, I mean, because of the nature of the migrant labor population, you know, there has been no kind of an organization or political and so on. But there was a public interest litigation uh, quite some time later. And the case was heard by the Supreme Court in India by a division bench of two judges. And when the judges heard, and I have the name of his lordship, he said the story of the migrant labor in the construction industry reads like a Shakespearean tragedy. And it has continued. But the poignancy of this is that there was a sum of 36,000 crores that had been kept aside for the welfare of the migrants. And to our utter shame, we had only used 3,000 crores of that. But I will now you know, go away from that and come back to what is happening today at Saavda Gevra. And I'm so happy that uh, 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 Savita Ben was here uh, to tell us, and she's there. But I am trying to anticipate this situation where the Guj Gujarat Mahila Trust might decide in a slightly phased withdrawal. What is going to happen? We need to create sustainable practices which can continue on the ground. And one of the things that I'm very happy to see is that we are also trying to create leadership positions from within. And the fact that she is the chairperson of the K block, you know, uh, residents and so on. And also we need to try and create some means of empowerment one of the things should also be that is it possible for us to start leadership training as well and those who can command the community's confidence and they can continue that would be something that i would like to ask and then see what is the we need to have a replacement if gmt is going to start you know moving out we need to create these sectors that's what i thought thank you thank you very much for that informed uh, important intervention about uh, the migrant workers uh, during these same mega events. Uh, mine is, a very is there another question? Yes, there is another question. Mark. My name is Vidya Subramanian. I work on uh, ideas of citizenship in the digital and stuff like that. And I want to go back to something that Arvind was talking about, which was the fact that uh, vote bank politics seems to have left the idea of the urban poor behind. And I and I'm wondering if you could say a little more about the about what what then happens. How is this working? How does democracy work anymore without the urban poor uh, voting for those who can work for them? If that is not what attracts them, then what are they casting their vote on the basis of? And is it that it doesn't matter anymore who's voting, or is it that it doesn't matter who's in power? I wondered if you could say a little more about that. Thank you. That's such an important fundamental question. Arbin Bai, would you address that, please, briefly? <laughs> Still uh, trying to kind of figure that out, Vidya, but uh, what we are uh, experiencing and, uh, and, and, and kind of uh, feeling in the community and, and as we work with people is that uh, this whole assumption of uh, class configuration of urban poor versus the middle class versus this, uh, that has drastically changed. And uh, even though the urban poor are uh, to a substantial extent, the most sort of impacted, uh, even the lower middle classes, not of evictions, but of uh, sort of different 
uh, uh, ways in which the state is functioning and they've been impacted, let's say uh, livelihoods or employment, for instance. Yet there are uh, political configurations that, that are kind of uh, allowing population groups to, to kind of forget the, the suffering and, and the, the pain that they are undergoing, yet cast the vote. So this could be called as uh, 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 saffronization of, of the urban poor, uh, slums which used to be actually the, the, the sort of real uh, uh, emblem of uh, all caste groups, religious groups living closer to each other because middle classes in India don't uh, or have not for, for, for historical, uh, since historical times. It's only the poor who have been forced to live together. And that also is is kind of changing. And I don't know, maybe Bijal Ben would uh, kind of uh, uh, agree to that when when relocations happened post evictions in uh, Ahmedabad, segregation also happened. Of resettlements uh, sites being marked, demarcated on religious lines. So those are things that are actually operating on the ground. And uh, uh, if I can just take thirty more seconds, we feel that there is a fundamental shift in the way. Uh, uh, urban discourse has been set and the, the shift is uh, so much to the right, re, I mean, aka read uh, smart cities, that, that, that all the political configurations are not able to kind of, their discourse is also shifted accordingly to accommodate that aspiration of world class cities is what we feel. There's a question on the Q&A by Ajay Sharma. Uh, could there be some viable policy be framed uh, for permanent resettlement for largest Shahabad daily slums in Delhi Northwest area? And uh, what will be the resettlement goals for migrant groups usually coming from rural belts to metropolitan cities for the next decades? Uh, this is specific, specifically for Shalini, ma'am. Is this, uh, do, are you going to uh, say some other are there any more questions or should I answer this I think these are two very important questions Shalini so answer those and yes. then unfortunately we're going to have to close okay yes okay so I think what I presented as the amendments that we are proposing to the resettlement policy would apply uh, to any resettlement colony which is that you know you give um, uh, tenureship um, you give, you allow people are, Beetle said, people are willing to pay and given the payment patterns as, as per, reflects the patterns in which they save and they earn and the documentation needs that are required for a freehold uh, and owner, um, uh, ownership of uh, secure, tenure security is made poor friendly. I think th those those policy recommendations that I made made in the last few slides would hold for uh, any resettlement colony in Delhi. And uh, our good uh, thing is that we already have a policy uh, which reflects uh, some of these. So it reflects an intention to resettle, to give tenure security. So there is a foothold there to extend it not just to the few that it uh, covers, but to a larger yeah. number of uh, people. I, Thank I you. Bijal Ben, do you want to add, please? Um, yeah, I, um, to, the, to the first question on leadership, uh, I think there is a very large leadership element that is already built in and we don't need to create it anew and that's the reason that Savita Ben is probably here and will continue to a certain extent uh, if and when MHD uh, withdraws. Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, second, I think, yeah, I would agree completely with Shalini Ben on the resettlement policies. Uh, and there is this entire document which can be made available uh, for people to go through it. But a lot of it also depends on uh, you know, probably, um, so I'm not aware of the Shabad dairy colony uh, because I am not myself from Delhi and we have never worked that. But, you know, Delhi has these three kinds of things. One is the Jubli, Juggi Jopri. One is the colonies which are already resettled like Savda Gevra. And the third one is, the uh, you know, 
unauthorized colonies. Uh, so probably the migrants are still not, it's a far, it's a long, long way to go, but there is this policy of night shelters for the migrant. And unauthorized colonies, I would largely say, is legalizing, is, is, is kind of in situ and legalizing their basic services and their living conditions is something. Resettlement colonies, like 40 of them have been resettled long back. <clears throat> and we are still talking of issues with those policies. <clears throat> and the third and the biggest thing that we are saying that any further resettlement now has to be given tenureship or titleship right away rather than trying to give it after 10 years or 15 years because then it uh, becomes a mess. And Juggi Jopris actually have <clears throat> sprung up just behind the, uh, besides the resettlement colonies in Delhi, currently have no recognition at all, not even that of getting a legal sewage or water connection. And uh, while they don't really get evicted unless and until you have something very big like the Commonwealth Games or uh, <clears throat> coming up where the land is needed. You know, there is still no formal recognition, even in terms of giving basic services to them. And, uh, and, and that's the biggest submission because even access to water and sanitation in India is looked at, um, you know, it, that it, it is linked with land and that people should get it only if they have a formal title. And the biggest campaign that we are running is that, you know, access to water and sanitation at the household level should be delinked from land titleship, which we have done in Gujarat in a big way. All slums, irrespective of the fact that they are on private lands, all government, all government uh, lands, or maybe get, you know, resettled in the future, should be given household level, uh, you know, basic services. Because that's what really, um, uh, you know, uh, actually uh, makes their life worthwhile. Of course, space also is a big, big issue in Delhi uh, as compared to other smaller cities in India. Uh, and that should also be re-looked at. Yeah. Arpin Bai, do you have a final sentence or two? Yeah, actually, I, I do have. So I'm just also stating from the campaign's behalf that that resettlement for us uh, is, I mean, uh, should not be even called as a last resort in a sense that unless and until you are really forced to resettle, uh, we wouldn't like really uh, advocate or talk about uh, uh, resettlement uh, in the first place. And that has been the approach of the master plan and, and the Mabi Dili campaign. And there are different measures and uh, suggestions that we had uh, in that space. Point number one, second, that uh, resettlement uh, policy, which I think actually, Shali ma'am, uh, Shali ji, this uh, was probably a draft and has not been implemented. I mean, we need to probably look into that. But there are very, very few states that actually have a, a working sort of uh, resettlement policy and none at a national level, none that coordinates central government land and 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 the uh, sort of uh, uh, state coordination that happens. So resettlement policy in that sense, essentially, even if it's very good, even if it's with all the basic amenities, services, so on and so forth, is uh, is, is similar to a Band-Aid, to a gash or a, or a wound, which, uh, because for resettlement for us then is essentially uh, uh, death in the case of two people that you experience to just access water. So it, it is something that sets you back by 15, 20 years or or by one generation. So policy, uh, we really don't know. So how do we navigate and secure what we have yet have provisions for future? I think that is one way of uh, looking at uh, some form of a resettlement policy that can benefit uh, people and communities. One interesting way, uh, just to close uh, on a funny note uh, and a very ironical note, uh, Bijal Ben, to the point that you mentioned of how water uh, could be provided to a lot of communities. I think the same way that electricity has been provided to a lot of communities in Delhi is to privatize it. Uh, <laughs> and the second you privatize, uh, it should get to all communities. Uh, even though we, I'm, I'm, I'm putting it as a joke, because even though we have uh, high court orders, directives, let's say Pani Hak Samiti case of 2014 in Bombay, Maharashtra, that states that water is a fundamental right, yet 
when it is with public authorities because they don't want to give services because they don't want to give rights or recognition to people they will not do it but when you privatize it they will give water atms they will give water tankers they will give uh, all the connections required which has happened in delhi for electric uh, connections thank you Martin. Gotcha. All right, and in the end, let me just, uh, Sabita Ben, agar mein pooch sakte hoon, aapke sab se bada aasha kya hai? Sabta Gerva ke liye, sab se bada aasha. Sab se bada, mere liye ye hai ki ke fatak pe flyover banaya jaye, jo ki bohut hi dukh daik hai se sabda ke liye. और फिर जो हमें 10 साल के लहसंस पर भेजा गया था और जो कि 15 साल हो चुके हैं उसके लिए हमारे लिए कुछ नहीं सोचा जा रहा है तो उसके लिए मुझे पक्के कागजों के लिए बोलना है कि हम कहीं से 10000 का लोन भी नहीं ले सकते कि हम कोई काम कोई बिजनेस या घर मकान बनाना चाहे या अपने बच्चों की शादी या कुछ भी करना चाहे तो हमें कहीं से 10000 का लोन भी नहीं मिलता है लोन मिलता है तो हमें जैसे ये आ, किसान वगैरह हैं तो वो ही हमें लोन देते हैं आठ परसेंट पर दस परसेंट पर वो हमारे मकान के कागज पर्चियां एक जो सात हजार की पिंक कलर की पर्ची मिली थी गुलाबी और एक सफेद पर्ची मिली थी हमें जो हमने सात हजार रुपए वहाँ पे जब जमा किए थे तो सावधान में आने से पहले तो हमें फिर दस साल के लाइसेंस पर भेजा गया था तो अभी तलक हमारे लिए कैसी कोई सुविधा नहीं है वहाँ पर तो मैं चाहती हूं कि हमारे सावधान के कागज पक्के किए जाएं रजिस्ट्री दी जाए हमें जो हम कह सकें कि ये मकान हमारा है अभी वो मकान हमारा नहीं है हमें डर लगा रहता है कि इसको हमें कभी भी हमें हटा सकते हैं क्योंकि हमें 10 साल का लाइसेंस पर दिया था वो 10 साल पूरे हो चुके हैं 5 साल ज्यादा हो गए अब क्या पता वो हमारे साथ क्या करेंगे हमारे मकान को कहां भेजेंगे कहीं कहीं फिर दोबारा जंगल में कहीं फिर पटक देंगे कुछ भी हो सकता है तो अभी ऐसा हमें उन्होंने कुछ भी नहीं दिया है तो हमें हमने चाहती हूं कि हमें पक्की रजिस्ट्री दें और हमारी रिहाईस के लिए और बहुत सारी चीजें हैं हॉस्पिटल होना चाहिए वहां पर हमारे लिए हॉस्पिटल नहीं है शमशान घाट भी नहीं है वहां पर जो पूरा पूरा लिस्ट का टाइम नहीं है लेकिन ये सबसे बड़ा आशा आपका तो कि पर्ची हो जाए रजिस्ट्रेशन हो जाए आपका घर जो आपने खुद बनाया है ये तो खास बात है डर लगा रहा है कि अब हमने उसमें थोड़ा थोड़ा कमा करके उसमें हमने पैसा भी लगाया है तो कहीं पर भी भेज देंगे तो फिर हम दोबारा से कैसे उसको जुटा पाएंगे कहां पर अपने बच्चों को लेकर जाएंगे बच्चे भी बड़े-बड़े हो गए तो अब हमारे लिए बहुत ज्यादा मुश्किल हो जाएगा तो मैं चाहती हूं कि हमारे लिए रजिस्ट्री हो जिससे हम कह सकें कि छोटा है घर लेकिन हमारा है अभी हम अपना नहीं कह सकते उसको I think that's a perfect note to end this very important panel on which is that uh, so many years later um Sabita Ben who built her own house uh built to rebuild her life and livelihoods still does not have a registration of ownership for the house that she built for herself. And that is an essential plank of any resettlement program. I want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank the audience and I want to thank the Mittal Institute. And um, thanks for staying with us a little bit of overtime, but I think it was important. Thank you.